So good morning, uh, Mel. Uh, welcome to season nine of uh, Wisdom of Friends show. I'm really delighted that you took the time to be on this uh, program. And let me start off by saying how we first met. Uh, we first got introduced at the National Speakers Association chapter here in Seattle. And uh, I heard you uh, give a wonderful talk about branding and brand messaging and the using of technology tools like LinkedIn to promote your brand. And I thought that just your you know, what you uh, do as, uh, as with your profession and your messaging would be really uh, valuable for my audience. So again, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to be on the show and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, like I told you a moment ago, this is a new style of podcast for me. So I am all excited to branch out even further. <laughs> No, that's great, Mel. And one of the ways we uh, kick off our show is by asking a guest a simple yet profound question, and that is, what's your favorite quotation and philosophy that you live by, and how have you applied it to your life? I think I have two. The first one is, well-behaved women never make history. So I'm notorious for getting myself into trouble, but you know what? It kind of leaves an impact, and it causes shifts, and... While it might be a little strenuous at the time, it's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have fun. I want to live life. And if I have to be a little mischievous to accomplish it, then so be it. And my other one is always ask why. Maybe I never grew up and I'm still a two-year-old inside, but why is still my favorite word. I don't just accept anything that is going on or happens or something that somebody tells me. I want to know why. And I kind of become like a pit bull and I need to figure out why. No, I, I like that. And it's, you know, and that's really also describes your brand as your personal brand as well, because one of the things I've seen you do in, uh, in your conversations and consulting with uh, other speakers at NSA and as well as working with other businesses that, you know, your, uh, you, you have this ability to think laterally and kind of drill, do a deep dive into why a certain thing is, needs to be done a certain way. And I think what that also helps us do is get clarity around what the brand is, what the message is. And, and again, I mean, does it even need to be done in the first place, right? At some point, yeah. you may have to come to that point and conclusion. I was talking to an Olympian gold medalist yesterday, and uh, what she shared with me uh, was really brilliant, too. I mean, what she said that when she runs into a situation where she lacks motivation and inspiration, and you know, because it's a grind every day when you're practicing for the Olympics, and, and what she did would do is when she has those moments of lack of motivation, she would ask those questions, why am I doing this? And kind of like drill it five times deeper yeah. and to get to that intention and that motivates her to kind of like go back and do those laps again in the pool. No, I, I totally like that. So my next question to you is to tell me where did you grow up and like uh, who were your influences growing up and how did that shape your life? So I grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia, very near where Bill Staten grew up. And uh, so I didn't have the, the healthiest upbringing and there was a lot of abuse in my home. Uh, it taught me, it, it gave me a hope that there's another way. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what that meant but it taught me that there was, there had to be another way. I couldn't, I remember sitting in elementary school at the, the lunch table and the girl sitting next to me was just obsessing over what was gonna happen on 90210. And I'm like, you have time for that? I'm worried about whether I'm gonna live till the next day and you have time to stress over a TV show? And it was almost a pivotal moment that it showed me there's another way to live. There's another way to be. And I was going to find it. So I held on to what was nebulous and imaginary at the time and held on to that core belief that I can create another life for myself and that I can overcome everything that I was experiencing. As far as people who in, inspired me, uh, my grandmother was there for me a lot growing up. She was a very pivotal person in my upbringing. Uh, 
kind of my safe haven, if you will. And then there were two, the irony of this is they were both English teachers that kind of took me under their wing. Uh, one in middle school, one in high school. The one in high school, her name's RJ. And she just, we just clicked. We were both kind of rebels and did things our own way. And we were just very direct with each other. And she eventually just kind of started introducing me as her daughter. And <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I love her. So. Wow. Now it sounds like, uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely, uh, encountered some challenges growing up and uh, and one of the it's commendable that early on you were able to pivot and like look at it that there was another way around us there was another better way to uh, navigate life and then also uh, leaning on to your grandmother and other influences in your life and so what where i want to take this conversation next is mel is that you made an amazing career uh, coming from Pennsylvania. I mean, you, out of those uh, childhood days back into, uh, you went to, uh, if I understand, at Foster School of Business to do your executive mm -hmm. MBA. Yep. And, uh, and now, like, you work with uh, global companies and with businesses and individuals and helping them define their brands and, like, brand positioning and communicating their brand values. And before I get into that is like, I wanted to ask you is, uh, how did you choose on this career path? How did that journey unfold for you? Was that like, did you know that, okay, this is business, that's where I'm headed, that's what I want to do, or were there other uh, ebb and flow or ups and downs along the way? I'm an accidental entrepreneur, and I'll give you the background behind it, and then I'll tell you how the accidental part happened. Uh, in high school, I believe it was my junior year, we had the worst snow winter on record. That we basically ended up losing, I think it was something like a month and a half of school. Not necessarily straight, but about a month and a half of school. So when we went back, all the teachers were cramming and just throwing work at us constantly, constantly, constantly. RJ was my English teacher. Uh, and I think we had something like five back-to-back -back term papers just in her class alone to get caught up. So the last paper, she agreed to let us do a team project and made every leniency possible to make it easy on us. I stayed after class, didn't say anything. I just sat in my chair. She eventually figured out I was still sitting there and she's like, you okay? And I said, no. She goes, what? I said, I'm not doing it. She's like, you're not doing what? I said, I am not writing another paper. I'm done. I will do anything else you want. I will take detention. I will put together a computer presentation for you. I will sit and have a, an hour or two interview with you. I will not write another paper. And she just looks at me like, you just told me no. <laughs> now keep in mind, this is before the days that technology was regularly incorporated into the school curriculum. And at the time, RJ was one of those people that pushing the button to turn the computer on, she would break it. So when I offered to put together what was the equivalent of a PowerPoint presentation, she's like, you'll do that? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I will. <laughs> so while everybody else in the class spent hours upon hours writing yet another paper, I spent 15 minutes putting together a PowerPoint presentation, had to stay after school to present it to her. Okay, great, I got out of a, writing a paper few weeks go by and the school's tech person comes, uh, is in the library and she's like, congratulations. I'm like, what? She goes, oh, uh, RJ is entering you guys into a national competition. What? <laughs> <laughs> so the first multimedia competition that was held in the country, I had to update my presentation to prepare for that, to submit it while that was going on, had a very similar encounter with the same tech person. She goes, congratulations. For what? I hear you're presenting to the school board. What? 
<laughs> yeah, RJ made the arrangements. The school board uh, meeting is has been rerouted, so it's going to be held at the school here, and you're going to give your presentation, and you're going to talk about how you put this presentation together and how you tied in the school curriculum. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I did it. Put the pre you know, made sure the presentation was school board ready and presented to the school board. Um, in your junior year, we had to read the Scarlet Letter and the Crucible and my presentation took the two books talked about the commonalities as well as the cultural elements and um, the cultural elements, we'll leave it at that. And uh, did not place in the competition, I actually got kicked out because I touched on religion. And then I went and because I'm, I can have, I can be stubborn, big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Decided I had to enter again. What I did not know is the school board was 100% behind me and the principal was told, whatever I want, I get. My school had un un uh, unfortunately been given a bad reputation prior to all of this. I had, the school had some of the, the biggest drug busts at the time. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Freeman brothers, but they were at my school. Mm. And so we had a reputation of producing drug dealers and murderers. And then I come along and I'm integrating technology into education and showing a new way of learning. Made it on the front page of the newspaper. The school started to get national recognition. RJ Stangerlin ended up being, uh, this is years later, <clears throat> but being given uh, an award from the Discovery Channel for uh, being one of the founders who created the implementation of technology into education. Wow. <clears throat> um, and she gives complete credit to me. I say thank you, but you know, she chose, she embraced the, the feedback that I gave her and, and I embraced the feedback that she gave me. It was a mutual, we grew together and, and we pushed each other and together we made an awesome team. So <clears throat> that is what started everything. And then in college, I had a professor, Dr. Jim Young, who took me under his wing and I basically became the college's unofficial PR person. And I would just be told, go here, go there, go here, go there. I could enter the state capitol even post 9-11, security didn't bat an eye. I could park an employee parking. And um, I did that the entire time I was there. When I graduated, the same work started to come with a paycheck. And I was like, oh, huh. Hence why I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. It was not something that was ever planned. It was just something I did. I was curious. I wanted to see and learn more and, and go beyond what was just there. The arrangement I had with the college was if I needed to skip class to go do something, I could. And I was like, no, I want to go to class. I want to learn and I want to do this. And so that's what I did. I chose both. I didn't see, and I still don't, I don't see life as one way or another. It's not black or white. It's black, white, and color when you choose to look at it that way. No, I like that. And, and this, this brings up uh, a couple of uh, questions for me too is, you know, what, what I, you know, hearing you share that, one of the questions that also comes up that this is, this is brilliant because uh, people who are listening to this uh, will definitely get some golden nuggets out of it. And what stands out is sometimes when life dishes out a particular assignment to you or a challenge or it could be at a workplace or it could be in school. Most of us kind of accept it as a given that that's what it is, but seems like you did not. You chose to question it right at a young age and say, well, I'm not doing this. Is there any other way that I could yeah. help out? And and that led to these, although it might have been initially a shock to the system on both sides, <laughs> 
but but you were able to navigate that and figure out a way to add value to uh, the you know the school and the school board and that created more opportunities and you know eventually uh, you know the school won an award thanks to your presentation and your uh, tenacity and determination and skill sets but that goes to show that you know pushing back and having the question of why or offering a different option can certain, sometimes work out in your favor. So my question to you is, why do you think some people are able to do that and some people go with uh, not even considering that option? Oh, I love that question because it's actually a question that I struggle with personally. Well, yes, I have many instances in my life where I stood up and I said no, or I stood up and I said, why this? There are just as many, if not more times when I didn't, and I wish I would have. We're, it almost feels like our society rewards conformity. And we're taught that as long as we're good, and as long as we listen, or we please somebody else, that we'll succeed. But then we want all the rewards of somebody who does something different. And the two aren't compatible. If you're only ever doing whatever anybody else tells you to do, you're never truly being yourself. And I'll give you a failure right here of my, my own. I did that with my own brand. My company name is Amical. Amical is a Phoenician goddess who is a parallel meaning to the Phoenix, meaning circle of life. It's how I work with my clients to help them see <clears throat> that their brand is more than just a clever tagline or sexy colors or a great campaign. It's more than just that. It's about how you do what you do. And that's how I work with my clients. Well, for years, I actually made that mistake of listening to and letting other people tell me what my brand was. I actually had people pull me aside. I had uh, two gentlemen off the top of my head do this. Literally pull me aside and tell me I had to change my company name. Not something I should consider. I had to. Like, they were my father and they were punishing me. No. What I learned about my company name is if you like my company name or you are neutral about it, you're gonna be a great client. If you have an issue with my company name, I guarantee it is not a good fit. And that is one of the core elements of building a strong brand, is you're going to have something that repels certain people. You want that in your brand. Look at Apple, you have diehard people, you have people who are diehard in love with Apple, and you have people who are diehard against Apple. It's because they have that strong brand. When you have that strong brand, you're not gonna appeal to everyone. If you're out there saying that everyone needs my service, then that's the first sign that you're relevant to no one. And that's okay. You want to be relevant to someone or to some section because when that segment of the market understands you, and the value that you offer, they feel like you're talking to them as an individual. You get them. They're not just another number in the queue. And that's the biggest thing is we all want to feel special. We all want to feel valued. Emotional intelligence is a huge part and brain science. They're huge parts of the branding. And it wasn't until I took control over my own brand, until I embraced me, that my business began to shift. The types of clients that I attracted shifted. The type of work that I was doing shifted into what was more in alignment with my strengths. No, that's great. And that's a really a profound uh, share, uh, Mel, because I think uh, what comes to mind is leadership and being true to your own values and standards and principles. And, and you know, it's like, 
standing for something. When you, if you don't stand for something, then you stand for nothing. It's like you try to please everyone. There is nobody. I mean, they just there is nothing. There is no market you're serving, literally. And uh, and I, as you said with Apple, you know, one of the things about Apple is the brand. When you think of Apple, it's the rebellion brand and the artistic brand. It's like there are there's a certain group of demographics that gravitate towards Apple, and and polar and that brings up a question about polarization, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing when you're trying to establish a polarized brand in a marketplace because you always are going to have those uh, so-called haters and uh, mm-hmm. on the other side. Uh, and I want to get to that here uh, in a minute, but the, the other question that comes up for me is, uh, you know, so how did you stumble upon your brand name as Omicle? Was that, what was your journey about figuring out the brand name for your business because that's something a lot of entrepreneurs deal with. Okay, what do I call my company? Is it going to sustain over the long period, like 10 or 20, 30 years down the road? Uh, And, you know, so what was your mindset and what was your process of choosing a brand name? And then if you want to talk about a little bit about the logo of uh, matching the brand name with the logo and so on and so forth, that would be great. Sure. So a lot of what you actually talked about was what went into it for me. At the time that I started my company, which was right around the time I graduated college, uh, Flash was huge. So every design, marketing, blah, blah, blah company had Flash in the name or something related to that. And I'm just like, no, no, no. A, I'm not going to name my company the same thing as everyone else. And two, I'm already seeing how fast technology is changing. So they were picking what I call a timely brand name, which means it is going to be irrelevant within five years. I wanted a timeless brand name. And so, and I also knew I didn't want my name. I had no intentions of keeping my maiden name, didn't know if I would ever get married, and it wasn't anything that I wanted, I didn't want to go that route. I wanted to give myself the freedom to be able to expand, maybe hire employees or license out what I was building. I wanted to have that freedom, and I knew that if I attached my personal name to it, it limited my ability to do that. So I was thinking ahead and thinking ahead in the concept of what if. Um, I, I'm, very, I'm pretty good with not putting on the rose colored glasses. So even when I go down the, the, the what if path, it becomes, okay, well, here's an option. It's kind of appealing. Here's another option. It's not really appealing, but I don't despise it. So I just kind of started looking at different options of what could be. And then because I knew technology was a core part of what I was doing, I had to factor that in. And meaning is very important to me. By the time I was 10 years old, I had five baby name books. You could rattle off any name. I could tell you what it meant and, and how to spell probably five different variations of it. I love names. And I love meanings and stories behind because that's the the hidden way of connecting. And I knew I wanted something that powerful to be the representation. So I went through countless names before the internet was what it is today and had lists everywhere, went through books, fictional books, factual books, and ended up with a book Uh, the book of magical names. I have it over there. And I just kind of literally paged through it and paged through it and wrote down different names that I liked. No matter what name, I kept coming back to Omicle. And I'm like, no, I can't do it. It's too powerful. (laughs) And so I, I really struggled with the name and I didn't want it. And I had a dream and I had to have it. And in the dream, it was kind of like I was being guided to and told that I was going to live up to what she 
was. And I'm like, that's really intimidating. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, my first logo was actually the letters stacked and I created a man from the letters. And I called him the Omegle Man. My original colors were a bright lime green before green was the thing. And it was a fun logo and it was, everybody talked about it. They're like, that's just so unconventional. (laughs) And uh, when green became popular, my, my visual brand got lost in the sea of what was trendy. And so I went back to the drawing board and the logo no longer felt right. It also, the color was wrong. And I started doing uh, a lot of research into the psychology of colors and how they affect people. And I wanted to tie the color to the meaning of the name and to what Amical was to become. And that's how I settled on purple. Purple is the only color that causes a a psychological adverse reaction subconsciously in people. The blending of a hot color red and a cold color blue, our brains can't process, Mm. which is why people have such an adverse reaction to it. They are either over the top in love with it or they are over the top hate it. They either love dark purple or they love lavender. And there's really no gray between. And I, I, found the, I found the element of how purple affects a person to also be a great way to wean out the clients that are not a good fit for me. And it, for me, it fit the Amical name. I had purple hair for about seven years. I remember that. (laughs) And (laughs) and it was funny because I had some clients that if we were in the wrong lighting and they couldn't see it, they would literally stop the meeting and say, where is your purple hair? And I'd have to go move over in front of a window so they could see it. And it just became an iconic part. They loved it. And you know, it's, again, it was all about attracting the right people to me. Is purple my favorite color? No. Is it one of? Yes. But people assume that it is my favorite color and it's an iconic part of my brand. Oh, that's great. And uh, so uh, what, what I'm also hearing is that one of the key elements of you building the brand was also putting together a filtering system for filtering out the clients that do not uh, gel or align with what you stand for, what your brand is all about. Mm-hmm. And, and so, I mean, I'm fascinated by what you just mentioned about the psychology of color and how that impacts uh, humans and, uh, you know, what the reactions are. Could you, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about psychology of color and what your research uh, indicated? Like, how does that imply? I mean, how do we, incorporate that into other areas of businesses if so like you know website design if you will or you know brand logo so what 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 is the psychology of color so tell us a little bit more about that that's so fascinating the the psychology of colors on one hand is incredibly fascinating on the other hand it's completely irrelevant and to select a brand color just because you think you're cheating the system psychologically is a guarantee that it's not going to work. So for example, red. Red is a color of passion and emergency, and it's the first color we're drawn to. It's also historically the last color that we were able to physically see. Mm. If you go way back in time, uh, or no, blue was the last one because seas were red originally. So red was one of the first colors, first colors we could see, not last, my apologies. And so initially a business may think, I want to have a red logo. Well, guess what? There's a lot of companies out there with red logos creating a sea of red. That's great. Red does have all of those power characteristics 
and it does draw your eye. But if everybody else is red, you just blend in. So it's the, the psychology element of it is, okay, look at how it can affect a person and look at what your competition is doing as well. There's also the element of personal experience with colors. If you have a negative um, experience with a color, you know, something bad happens to you in a place where the room was painted orange, then for you, regardless of what I tell you orange means, orange is always going to be a negative. Interesting. Until until you heal from whatever that situation was. So it can guide, but it doesn't dictate. Absolutely, so it cannot be the defining factor. It can be uh, an enhancing factor yes. to an already uh, built messaging and yes. uh, you know uh, what the content stands for. No, I, I like that because I remember when I wrote my, and now in hindsight, when I published my first book almost 10 years ago, the book jacket was red and now I, now I think of it, like most of the colors that I normally choose is red. That's apparently is my favorite color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now, now I think of it. But yeah, I've also noticed like, you know, when you walk into a bookstore, there are like, there's opportunities for what color your book jacket can be because that can draw the attention too. And lately, if uh, you know, I've walked into a bookstore, well, not in the last three months, obviously, but but you know, it's like there's a lot of orange that I see with some of those latest bestsellers that uh, that's come out, and uh, and I wonder if there has been some kind of research that's gone into why they picked orange, and I'm sure it's the psychology of color at play there. So uh, no, that's great, and uh, I want to before we shift gears into uh, more about doing a deep dive on branding. One question I do have is. What are books, uh, some of the books that you've uh, gifted or reread over the years? Any recommendations for our audience? I have a tendency to not reread re books, uh, but usually what I'll do is I will read a book and then I will give it to somebody else. It's always the whole pay it forward thing. Um, the One of the current books I'm reading right now is Madly in Love with Me. And then I've also, I found an old book of unmarketing um, that I meant to read a while ago and I just refound the book. So those are the two I'm reading right now. And like I said, when I'm done with books, I give them to somebody else and I always do the whole pay it forward. All right, that's great. And we'll include those in our show notes as well. So uh, in case the audience wants to find out more. Uh, the next question is, if. If you could, then this is just a hypothetical situation here, Mel. Uh, if you could go back in time and talk to your young self, mm -hmm. having seen the ebb and flow of life, what would you say, uh, what, what, would, what's the advice would you give her? To the kid in school who said, I'm not gonna write the term paper. <laughs> I, th I think the advice that I would give is to not rely so much on external validation. Mm. And there's value in external validation and there's value in feedback from others. There's a difference between listening to it, taking it and applying it as it's relevant to you versus letting it control you. And that's a really hard lesson to learn. And I don't think my younger self could ever understand it, but if that's something that I could have learned at a younger age, I would be most grateful for that. I like that because uh, having that discernment to be able to choose your feedback uh, appropriately, if you will, and not everything that anybody says is uh, appropriate and correct and uh, constructive. So having the wisdom to know what to filter out and what to filter in. Yeah. Now that I like that. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, so shifting gears here, and I want to get into uh, a little bit more about branding. And, and the, most of our audience are listening to this uh, podcast are executives working at corporations, and then we have a lot of business owners and obviously uh, professional speakers and then creative artists and uh, you know, solo premiers as well. 
So the first question that I want to ask you, Mel, is uh, when I think of branding, you know, it, it's it, for me, it's about developing a promise. It's about making that promise, delivering that promise, and doing it in a memorable way. So my question to you is, what does branding mean to you? And how do you think this is going to transform in the post-pandemic COVID-19 situation? What's your take on that? So the, the post-pandemic, I actually have an article coming out on that. So depending on when you release this, that might time up perfectly. Um, as for branding, I, I hear it described a lot as the promise. And I th what my experience has shown me is the promise helps the individual with accountability. The reality is you can say, I promise, I promise, I promise from dawn till dusk every day for the rest of your life. If you don't take those actions, if you don't live that way, it doesn't matter. Your brand is actually the expectation of what somebody else is going to experience with you. It's their experience not what you say. You have the ability to create the framework of the type of experience they can experience working with you. You can't dictate it. You can give words to it. You can give feelings to it. You can create the environment. Environment meaning the store, the, the feeling meaning any music that you choose um uh, the tone for if you release videos you can create the consistency in a feel you have control over creating the framework you don't have control over the experience of the emotions that the person is going to have and that's the difference is it shifts it from being all about me it's all about you no i like that and uh no it's it sounds like you can do your preparation you can do your homework you can create an environment but eventually it's really about what the customer has the final say of how they are going to define your brand and what that means to it. so it's really you don't have the control over the outcome but you do have uh the control over how would you like to direct the positioning of the brand in the marketplace, but eventually uh, it's the customer who decides and they have the final say. And that's probably where the brand loyalty comes into play. And I want to get to that in a second, but also the follow-up question to that was, how do you see branding would transform the post-pandemic uh, situation uh, oh, yes. given the current uh, circumstances that we are all dealing with here? So to follow up on what we were just talking about, and then I'll lead into the, the post-pandemic, um, I have an activity that I do with my audiences when we talk about branding, and I call it the grocery store exercise. I have them get together in groups, and I give them a grocery list. Milk, bread, and eggs. Sometimes I throw in toilet paper, depending on how long the presentation is, and I say, I want to know anything you can tell me about the brands of these products that you bought last time you went to the store. And all of a sudden you see everybody's eyes get huge. Mm. You're like, I don't know. I just picked up the white milk <laughs> <laughs> or I just picked up the brown eggs. And I, I tell them, I say, it's okay. And then we come back together and we talk about what they were able to remember about each brand. You heard me mention earlier that the color purple is iconic to my brand. Apple has its own iconic elements, the little Apple logo or the music that it uses. Your market is gonna latch on to one thing, maybe two. They're gonna latch on to one thing. And that is what they're gonna know for your brand. The average person, you're gonna spend countless hours, weeks, months, years, building your brand, building out the values, building out the mission, building this out, building that out. You're going to know your brand so intimately and where companies often get misguided is they make the assumption 
that their market knows everything they know about their brand. And they don't. They latch on to something. And it's hysterical to hear the one time I gave that, uh, I was giving a presentation to college kids and we're going around talking about what everybody remembers. And I had toilet paper in this presentation <laughs> and, and the one kid raises his hand and like almost jumped out of his seat. I was like, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, it has a bear on it. <laughs> He's like, I can't remember the name, but it has a bear on it. <laughs> and, and he proved my point. You know, he goes, I walk down the aisle and I look for the damn bear. <laughs> and that's what ends up happening. It's about simplifying your message, about simplifying the value that you provide and keeping it you focused so your market can emotionally connect with who you are and what you offer. When they emotionally connect with you, that's when you build that brand loyalty. Now to lead into the post pandemic, we're seeing a massive shift, a massive shift. We've got Gen Z who is the youngest generation, well, not the youngest generation on the planet, but the youngest generation that is, has research being done on it. They're in school and approaching college at this point. <clears throat> They're being influenced and their world is being rocked. They're being told that it is not safe to be around people. They're being told that they have to stay home to stay safe at, key foundation, at a key foundational time in their life. There's a chance that we are raising a generation that will never know how to grocery shop because so many people are moving to online grocery shopping. Now, for the women listening, they're probably joking, saying that, that, you know, there's a whole gender that currently don't know how to grocery shop, and that's okay. We're just going to expand that. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is we're not just shifting brands, we're shifting experiences with brands. Before, a brand was about how to create the product, how to make it look good, how to... Uh, if you have a store, how to make the store work, how to create a website. These were all timed, specific tactics to do. And with this lockdown and then post follow-up, we're adding a whole new element to this. We're going to see a level of innovation and a level of, ex of expectation that is completely unheard of. Currently, Gen Z doesn't have the brand loyalty that companies are accustomed to having with the younger generation. They're more about uh, what their friends are doing and the experience as opposed to aligning themselves with a brand, where millennials, on the other hand, are more about including and using the brand to define who they are as a person. It's a shift in mentality, which means it's gonna be a shift in how companies need to think about their brand, think about how they work with their employees. This is gonna change everything from external branding to internal branding. Operations of a company and communication all across the board are gonna completely change. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, some of the industries that will thrive, uh, that I can anticipate as part of this pandemic, just thinking about it, is working from home now, like all the remote tools and, uh, you know, the companies will have to reposition uh, their recruiting message uh -huh. for, uh, you know, the Gen Xs and the Millennials and uh, Gen Zs to say that we do offer the option of working from home and then the industry that will also succeed potentially are like, you know, companies like Zoom and what kind of other bolt on applications that people can build to enhance that kind of technology. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's gonna be, and then even the commercial real estate. I mean, I don't know, there was an article by, uh, on Business Insider the other day I was reading where Eric I was Schmidt, just gonna mention that. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the conventional uh, thought is that, uh, you know, that nobody's going to be working from the offices and so you won't need a lot of commercial real estate. But it seems like he had a different take on it. And he said that, in fact, you would actually need more space 
because of the six feet distancing, yep. uh, uh, you know, protocol that uh, companies are adopting now. But that's great. And I want to go back to uh, what you said earlier about Apple. You know, Apple's the company that you know it's uh, it's uh, positioned itself in the technology marketplace to be like you know it's bringing out the best in every human being. And you know, if you go to the Apple website, we all know this that you know if you compare it with any other website, like you know, I don't want to name names, but any competitor of Apple, <laughs> and when they, when they when they're selling all these products online, you know, you have these technical specifications like you know 128 gigabytes of storage built in and 512 gigs of expandable storage, right? But when you look at Apple, the message is very simple and it's human, it's benefit oriented. And instead of talking about gigabytes, right, the message is something like lose yourself in 50 million songs. Yeah. But that is memorable, right? That's something yes. that you can relate to. And that's why you see these lines outside Apple stores, uh, you know, when a new product comes out. So my next question to you is, uh, I know uh, you work, one of the things that I appreciate and admire about you, Mel, is that, you know, you, you position yourself so brill brilliantly with your brand and messaging is because of your skill sets of blending the communication with technology and the art of communicating with people because that's the blend of what you bring to a business, to an individual. And so would you be willing to talk about your process in helping companies and individuals define their brand and their messaging so that it goes viral? What does that process entail? So people get a taste of what is it like to work with you and one-on-one -on -one and things of that nature. So you mentioned my tagline, which is building brands worthy of going viral. Uh, that's, that is my core message. When, if we were to meet at a networking function, you were to come up to me, ask me what I do, that would be my answer. I build brands worthy of going viral. It's what I call my wow statement. And when I realized that I had it, I had the core, of my brand is when somebody else introduced me using those words, not me. I didn't tell them how to introduce me. They took the words and ran with them on their own. That's when I knew I had the right statement. And that's what connects with my audience. They hear that statement and psychologically, it creates the connection in their mind of, I'm worthy. Why am I not viral? And it opens the door for a conversation. And when I work with companies, because most companies won't walk around and say, hey, I have a branding problem. But they will walk around and say, I hate social media. It doesn't work. Why don't people know my message? Why aren't they listening to me? Because of how I work with them, they begin to see that activities on social media or marketing are not just another to-do item, but it's actually attached to the operations of their business, the culture of their business. And when you make that connection, and when you realize that all of your marketing initiatives, all of your social media activity goes back to your core values and the goals that you're seeking to accomplish with your company, you get different results you get a different mindset and it becomes more inclusive because then you begin to see how, oh, this part of my business is not separate from this. Technology is not separate. Social media is not separate, but they are a way for me to accomplish my goals. They're a way for me to grow my business, increase my profits, reduce my expenses, well, initially it'll increase your expenses, but <laughs> reduce your expenses, reduce the time you spend doing certain activities. And so uh, a lot of times I'm brought into a company because everything, particularly marketing and operational perspective in their mind has blown up and is this big mess and they don't know what to do. And they're just like, here, take this, fix it and fix it. We don't even know where to begin. That's how bad it is. And so what I do is then I basically go into detective mode, figure out what they already have, 
And then from a lot of conversations with them, listen to what they say they need. And there's also a lot of observing. Because sometimes you say you need something, but your actions show that something else would be of more value. And so that's where going through this process of these three areas, you begin to see, oh, from a technology perspective, from an operational perspective, you need this, this, and this, 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 and this. And when it's presented to them that this is what they need and here's what they said that they needed and here's how this can deliver that, and again, it begins to click. Oh, so we can improve X when we make Y change. They're like, we've been fighting with that forever. This is how you do it. And so a lot of times that's what I'm brought into companies for is it's kind of a, an interim marketing CMO position or the new term is fractional CMO, which I think is funny, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, to solve this problem and then turn it back over to them so they can manage it on their own because they then have the technology they need. They then have the processes that they need. They then have a strategy that they need. But it's all in alignment with what the company goals are and what the company is trying to accomplish. It's not just throwing spaghetti on the wall. No, it's great. I like that. And, uh, and, and so would you also say that, that like with every uh, brand messaging, there comes a time when you have to question, even if it's been successful and it's had its run, there comes an end point where you have to like reevaluate and reassess everything and say, it's time to reinvent the brand too, right? Because oh, yeah. there could be a point in every company's uh, product life cycle, if you will, that, oh, yeah. that, you know, or even with personal branding, if you will, you know, people oh, yeah. who have name changes or people have a name change for the company. Right. And uh, so what, what are your thoughts on it? When do you think is an appropriate time to have a reinvention discussion regarding the brand messaging and brand values? So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is timeless versus timely. A brand can be built with timely or timeless intentions, but then become timely. So when something kind of becomes dated, so in the technology world, it's very easy if you choose a tech name to become outdated very quickly. It's very easy for that to happen. So picking a timeless name is a lot harder in that particular industry. Uh, I actually just went through this with a client. They had, uh, it was an organization that was named after the founder. The founder is, basically on his deathbed and ready to go at any time. The executive team is very much personally mourning this because they all know him. And I was brought in to help them with this rebranding and repositioning. The core of the organization stayed the same. All we did was take their strengths and redefine it based on what is relevant today and will help them launch and move forward in the future. We took the organization name away from a person, which, the, which most people in their market don't even know who that person is anymore, and we made it more about the mission of the organization. And yes, rebranding, Anybody who tells you that rebranding is easy is lying to you. And anybody that tells you that rebranding is not personal or emotional is also lying to you. Because whether you're rebranding yourself as a person or you're rebranding an organization, people have that emotional attachment to a brand. And when, you th when you're offering to change that, whether they want to or not, it can come across as a personal attack that something is wrong with them, even though that's not the case at all. We're trying to honor the past and create the position of relevance to move forward. No, I like that. It's, uh, you know, it's not 
completely giving up on the values that have defined you up until this point. So you honor it, acknowledge it, but at the same time, you kind of extend beyond, uh, you know, so you make it timeless as you go forward. And one of the case studies that comes to mind is, and this is uh, most recently too, I mean, in the last year or two is Nike, right? I mean, when you think of Nike, the tagline is just do it campaign, right? It's about drive. It's about the determination and, uh, but you know, like what they did like that significant pivotal shift, I think it was a year and a half ago when they kind of like changed the messaging to it's like, believe in something, mm-hmm. even if it means sacrificing everything, right? And then they had, uh, the, you know, superimposed that with the NFL quarterback political activist Colin Kaepernick's face. Now that takes on a whole new meaning and relevance to yep. the brand. Uh, so, so that's another example of like, you know, be current with the changing outlook of the global affairs or current affairs or what's going on and being listening to what the market is telling you and then, you know, being staying true to your values, right? And And it's- uh, An even bigger extreme example of the the repositioning is what Old Spice has had to do over the last five years or so. They were so highly niched in their market and now their market is dying off physically. They were completely irrelevant and nobody would below a certain age would buy their product. So they had to go through a completely massive campaign redesign of all of their products to appeal to a younger and a broader generation. And the initial feedback was, ew, I'm not using that, my grandfather does. But now it's one of the most popular brands out there because they stuck to it. This is what I'm talking about with the emotions. You're going to get emotions, you're going to get the feedback. If you remember uh, when Microsoft launched uh, Windows 7, the campaign that was launched, they did a pre-campaign and then they did a campaign. They knew that no matter what they launched, there was gonna be people that loved it, people that hated it, and it was they would not be assessed fairly. So they launched a pre-campaign of Bill Gates and and I forget who the other guy was, doing random things, walking down the street with a suitcase and going into random people's homes. It meant nothing. They openly admitted that this was just a distraction to get people to act about, to lash out about this, so they could be open to seeing what was coming. Also a part of that campaign, what they did is they set up pop-ups all around the country. And they took Windows 7, which got massively negative reviews, they cloaked it and said, oh, this is a new version of Windows and we're looking for your feedback. People used it because they didn't know it was Windows 7 and they're like, this is amazing about time they listen to us and it's really easy to use so then part of the campaign is they showed this and they said guess what this is windows 7 you perceived it to be awful because of our past mistakes but when you didn't know it was it was a huge success Yep, that's great. That's such a great example. And, uh, you know, the takeaway from this conversation really is you can bring in uh, the right kind of brand strategies to any situation. And there is always an opportunity to turn it around, uh, no matter how dire the situation may look at any given time. And you know, that these are great points, Mel. And, uh, you know, I could talk to you more about most of our branding conversations. and But I want to kind of... Uh, before I move into our next section in the interest of time, one you had one of the blog posts that you had written was about the stickiness of the vision and mission statement. So if you want to give us a little tip about what could companies or individuals kind of keep in mind when they are defining their vision or mission statement so that it kind of like sticks around and people can, like for example, you know, it could be as simple as Salesforce having, you know, no software or Nike just do it or Subway eat fresh. Right. I mean, they communicate this entire thing in just like one or two words. And that just like 
stays with you uh, for a long time. But what, what are your thoughts on that and any tips that you can give us? You hit the nail on the head right there with simplicity. A lot of time what organizations will do is they unintentionally write a book as their mission statement or their vision statement. And then it becomes so cumbersome that it just becomes words on paper. Nobody cares about them. Nothing happens to the words on paper. And that's not the purpose of them. So let's talk about what a mission and vision statement are. The vision statement is in an ideal world where there's, in an ideal world, you have completely solved whatever problem you are seeking to solve. You've not healed the world, just your little slice of the pie. In an ideal world, what does that look like? You've solved that problem. You've put yourself out of business. That is your vision. Your mission is your day-to-day -day tactical, how do you accomplish that? Your mission becomes your accountability. If you're having a hard time making a decision, choosing between A and B, you should be able to go to your mission statement, read the mission statement, look at your two options, and say, you know what, it's crystal clear, I need to do A. Your mission statement is your accountability. Your vision statement is your high in the sky, you've solved the world's problems related to this, and this is the new reality. The shorter and the simpler you can make these two statements, the easier it is to make it a part of the culture that other people talk about and other people adopt as their own. No, I like that. No, that's uh, absolutely a, a very effective way of uh, defining it. It's like vision is uh, your long-term pie in the sky. Uh, well, not in the pie in the sky, but essentially the timeless uh, ideal scenario that uh, your company or you can commit to. And then mission is your day-to-day -day operational tactics and accountability of uh, how you can execute on that vision. I like that. So moving on to our next section here, and this is uh, the rapid fire round. And I have a bunch of fun questions for you, Mel. And this is your first response that comes to your mind. Oh boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here it is. Uh, what is your favorite music band? Don't necessarily have a favorite music band. Songs get stuck in my head and I know lyrics to songs no one person should ever know lyrics to. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, what's, what's one song that uh, has stuck in your brain right now that you're kind of like just going on and on about? I, I was actually listening to, to Nickelback when, when you popped on the call. So Nickelback <laughs> right now is in my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what is one thing you can do that might surprise other people? that I can do or let's see that I can do. I'm, I'm not afraid to try something, but I think everybody knows that. I'm, I'm pretty transparent as to, to who I am. So I don't know if much. Well, so in the past we've had answers like, you know, they, 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 somebody was a magician that nobody knew that they were, they could do magic tricks or something. I'll tell you I'm a climatologist. Oh, wow. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is, whose brain would you like to pick? Uh, alive, I think it would be Richard Branson. Mm, uh, definitely a very uh, adventurous, passionate, and he's got his own amazing brand for sure. Yeah. And... and uh, and his willingness to, I'll call it explore, but it, that's truly what he does. He's like, I don't know anything about this. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the marketing messaging, and it's just brilliant the way he goes about it. And you know, do you know how the Virgin name started? I've heard uh, a little story about it, but anyway, fill us in. Uh, what was, uh... Because the, I think it was the airline industry was the first one. Uh, they knew nothing about it, and joking around, they said, we're virgins, and it stuck. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and also, one of the things that I've heard about, uh, you know, how that came into existence, too, is that he negotiated with Boeing about returning the planes if the business didn't go as planned. So he yep. had that 
backup plan in place. So as you know, most of us listening to this, when they make the highly successful investors and entrepreneurs, they always take calculated risk. It's not about just recklessness and, yeah. uh, you know, it's so, so something to keep in mind. I mean, that's uh, what, what's the downside and how can you, you know, take care of it in the event yeah, something doesn't work out. They're so. not naive in the decisions that they make. They are fully informed. They, they track their numbers. They know what they're doing. And that's a lot of what I try to incorporate into how I work with my clients. I'm all about, if you want to take a risk, let's go but let's make sure we have the information. Let's make sure we have the resources and that we're prepared. Absolutely, absolutely, I like that. What color describes you best? Well, I Other than purple. purple. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, uh, I would say it's actually opal, which is a blending of colors. Uh, the way I tend to, to work, and also I am personally as well, is I ebb and flow and I feed off of the people I'm around. Mm. So if you put me with a bunch of creatives, I, I kind of balance it out and become more of the, the science, the engineer. But if you put me around engineers, I kind of balance it out and become the creative. So to me that uh, color wise, it's very opally. Got it. Do you believe in magic? No. Of course, hands down. No questions asked. <laughs> Harry Potter okay. is a regular thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your favorite word? Why? Hmm. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. The next one is, uh, and here's, here's an interesting situation. Let's say you are the brand strategist for a global company and, and it, you could have any message of your choice on a billboard. Ooh. What would that be? Ooh. Well, now, see, so you put the caveat of it's it's another company. So for me, well, let's take that out. It's for you. It's <laughs> your your you get to pick and choose in any message. What would that be? <laughs> so if we go with my brand, it would uh, in my Facebook group. I have a a banner across the top that it says, "It's time for you to stand out." I said so. So right oh, now, nice. that would be it. It's that's nice. I had someone on the podcast say, "Send money." <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so uh, moving on to, uh, uh, that wraps up a rapid fire. Moving on to a final section. I just have last three questions for you, Mel. And the first one is, uh, what is the current personal or business passion project that you're working on? And uh, what are you looking forward to in the next six months or a year from now? I'm looking forward to honestly seeing how COVID-19 is changing the workforce, business, the market. Um, I've been watching it closely and talking with uh, businesses of various industries to see what they're doing and how they're responding. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, from my business perspective, I've, uh, I'm going to be starting to update all of my online trainings and relaunch all of those. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and I've started to do some research into AI and looking into how, because right now AI is positioned as this, this far off thing that only corporate can have and manage. And there's going to come a time when small businesses or medium businesses, AI needs to become affordable and usable. So no, that's kind of something I'm interested in. No, it's great. And then uh, where can people find out more about you now? You Are you on social media and uh, yep. Facebook? Twitter? Yep, I am on Facebook under Amical, or uh, you can search me out, Melanie Asher, uh, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram as well. And yeah, of course, on my site, Amical.com. Yeah, and we'll include that in the show notes as well for people to find out more. And then uh, the next question is, what are three things you're grateful for in life? today? Oh, <clears throat> definitely grateful for my son. Uh, I'm grateful for my ability to say I matter. And for the awareness of the support system that I have around me. 
No, that's uh, awesome. And uh, I want to take a moment here to acknowledge you, Melanie, because, you know, uh, having talked to you and having had these interactions and then, uh, you know, this amazing conversations and learning more about you, what stands out is that your incredible passion and uh, ability to look at things differently so that innovation uh, kind of can continue in this uh, society today because of people like you are asking the question why. And that's what changes the direction of humanity because people like you have questioned the status quo. And uh, the other thing that I also uh, acknowledge you for is that helping people and businesses communicate the deepest messages and that is resonating with their values. And that's not an easy thing to do. And you help them communicate their message to the world. And so that's such a contribution you are to the society. And, and you're just a fun person to talk to and be around. And so thank you for being who you are. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. And I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the years as well. And so thank you. Great. And uh, one final question, and this is how we wrap up all our interviews. And this is, uh, why do you think people should listen to the wisdom of friends? So Patricia Fripp was a client of mine for many, many years. And she has a saying that that I think is perfectly relevant to why people should listen to the wisdom of friends. You help your listeners see the person behind the title. I can give you my resume. I can give you my professional credentials. But ultimately, what you're doing is you're revealing who I am inside. Wow. And you do that Thank you. Each of your guests. Each of your guests. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for that feedback. And I really enjoyed and appreciated our conversation. And for everybody listening, with that, we'll wrap it up. And if you like what you heard, please share. Don't be shy.